Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring the magic of quantum physics. My guest is Paul Levy, who works with groups and individuals from a Jungian perspective. His website is awakeninthedream.com. He is the author of The Madness of George W. Bush, Dispelling Watiko, Awakened by Darkness, and most recently, The Quantum Revelation, a radical synthesis of science and spirituality. That will be the topic of our discussion today. This is an internet interview, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Paul. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. This will be our third interview, and now we're going to dig into uh, the work you've done on uh, quantum physics. I know that uh, studying physics, even though you're not a physicist, has been a passion of yours for a long time. Totally, yeah. And I just want to, I'm so glad you clarified that. I'm completely not a physicist. I'm just an ordinary person. But how come I got so interested in quantum physics was based on um, these experiences I began having in 1981 in which um, stuff began happening in my life that was pretty impossible, that could only happen in dreams, that weren't supposed to be able to happen in this world that I was inhabiting. And um, I didn't realize it then fully. I still don't realize it fully, but I was being shown something about the nature of things and the nature of myself. And then over the years, as I, um, you know, like everybody would read the Tao of physics or just books like that, I began all of a sudden to have the recognition that, oh my God, what quantum physics is describing, it really helped me to make sense of this world that I had um, found myself in. And so I just, at a certain point, I just went so down the rabbit hole of quantum physics um, that it really, um, it helped me to integrate what I was experiencing. So that's really the deeper context for how I came across quantum physics. Let me go to one of the o opening statements of your book that really uh, caught my eye. You said that writing the book itself, The Quantum Revelation, was an act of ceremonial magic. Yeah, yeah, totally. In the sense that it was not like, oh, I had this understanding and let me just, you know, put it in words. No, the act of actually finding the words and, you know, creating the book was the very thing that was deepening the real of my own, you know, the realization that I was having. So, and that to me sort of made it some form of creative artwork, which is like magic, because by doing that, I was, I was literally transforming myself. And, and that's what magic is, as well as transforming the whole universe that I was inhabiting. So yeah, it was not an ordinary, I mean, it was not just an ordinary act. It, for me, it's felt like, a, it felt like a spiritual practice, what I was doing, really. You point out in your book that when we take a good hard look at quantum physics and you quote any number of eminent physicists who themselves use the word magic to describe uh, physics, uh, we're dealing with something metaphysical and by uh, its very nature that awakens us to uh, contemplate our own spirit and uh, the, the far reaches of the human mind itself. As I really began to study what the founding fathers, what their experience was in encountering quantum physics, it was like the, the floor had gotten pulled out from under them. You know, up until that moment, they thought they were studying, you know, in the, in the classical universe, you know, um, before quantum physics came on the scene. They thought there was this objective world and they were just passive observers who were trying to understand it. And all of a sudden, um, they had this, um, this realization 
that they hadn't bargained for. In other words, there are a lot of ways of saying it, but all of a sudden, um, the factor of, of consciousness had entered into the physics lab and it entered into their equations and they didn't know what to do with that. That wasn't the, what they had signed up for. And so it, it's so, um, for the ones who really were, were the real physicists, in other words, who were after the truth and didn't have preconceptions and were following whatever little thread, um, you know, was interesting to them, they began to, they opened up, um, this world where the idea of, the physical world and the spiritual world or just the world of mind or consciousness that became indistinguishable. And so for them, as they began to explore what they were discovering through quantum physics, it was changing them. It was changing their, their consciousness. And that's, you know, a hundred years ago, that's not what um, your typical academic corporate physicist had signed up for. So it really was confronting them um, with these deep metaphysical issues. And it was challenging them, you know, um, to come to terms w- in a sense with who they are. And that's one of the things that I want to talk about that quantum physics promoted itself uh, to the surprise of the physicist to become to actually be a spiritual path. And that was, you know, either that was the physicist's worst nightmare or their highest dream. It's unclear, but that wasn't what they had expected, that all of a sudden what they were discovering in quantum physics was shedding light on the nature of who we are. And and now Einstein famously resisted quantum physics. Uh, I'm not sure he ever really accepted it. That is true. Now, he was one of the founding fathers of quantum physics. But he, you know, as I deepened my study, I, I learned that he was really attached to that there was an objective world and he couldn't let go of that idea. And that's what quantum physics was basically shedding light on so as to empirically prove that that's a nonsensical idea, that it's a false idea. There is no such thing. It, it's just that. It's just an idea. It has no correlate to reality. And Einstein just couldn't let go of that because in his mind, what science was, was all based on that there, there was an objective world and we were trying to study it and understand it. So, you know, he took it to his grave that he just couldn't really get his mind around what quantum physics was actually, you know, um, showing us. It's true. People who look at quantum physics theoretically, uh, agree with you for the most part that uh, the idea of a, a subjective objective distinction uh, is is an artifact it's not real on on the one hand on the other hand we have all this technology computers and cell phones and uh, radios and televisions and on and on and on that uh, are clearly you know, to the average person, uh, examples of objective world technology that stem from quantum physics. Yes, that's true. And and the real cutting edge physicists are saying all of those technologies that have changed the world and changed the course of history, that that's the low hanging fruit, that that's less than 1% of the benefits that quantum physics is offering us, and that the real benefits is in our mind is is um in our consciousness that it's actually um showing us in a sense who we are and the nature of how our consciousness actually plays a major part in the creation of the universe so with all those incredible technologies that's just sort of the minor stuff and um because you know just to understand i mean you know for people who aren't overly familiar with quantum physics here before quantum physics came on the scene hundred years ago, a little bit more. Um, Like I was saying, the classical physicists thought they were studying an objective world. Quantum physics comes along, shows, it proves um, beyond a shadow of doubt, there is no such thing. And not only that, that the act of observing the world actually influences the universe that we're observing. The observer effect is what that's called. That's the rabbit hole. As soon as I, I became familiar with that, I realized, oh my God, that's the rabbit hole that, you know, just opens up everything about what I'm really interested in, because that idea that the act of 
observing the universe actually affects the universe, that's exactly like a dream. Because quantum physics is empirically proving, and maybe a lot of physicists, you know, yeah, I'm not a physicist, but I'm just a curious person, and I know about, you know, I connect with my dreams and was having this experience of the dreamlike nature of this reality, and I was realizing, oh, my God, quantum physics is describing the dreamlike nature of reality. Quantum physics it has empirically proven beyond the slightest shadow of a doubt that we are having a collectively shared dream. And what that that's mind-blowing because it's basically saying that the act of observing each and every moment, the act of us observing this universe is creative. That we're not that that the act of observation is not just a passive act, but we're actually creating moment by moment our experience of ourselves and our experience of the world. And that's like pointing at, you know, the incredible and it's 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 sort of, you know, to the majority of us, it's untapped creative power. We are we carry this unbelievable creative potency and because we're unconscious of it we're you know um implementing it unconsciously to the most part in a way that's destroying us and that's being writ large in the greater body politic of the world on the world stage and quantum physics when you actually um because you know it's so controversial as you know um, everybody has their own theory of what it means. And here, I'm not a physicist, but I'm just saying, well, wait a second. If you look at it this way, if you have the recognition that it's reflecting that quantum physics is both pointing at the dreamlike nature and it's an expression of the very dreamlike nature that it's pointing at, and it's showing us this incredible creative power that we have as we take that in that's um, I'm actually, you know, um, trying to make clear that that's the real gift of quantum physics, that if we can gain insight individually and with other people who are also tapping into this and begin to understand, wow, it's like quantum physics has come on the scene and it's actually reflecting back to us this unimaginable creative power that all of us have that can change um, evolution. That's evolutionary. And that can change the course of human history, and it all depends if we have the recognition of what it's actually showing us. Now, I have to say this, Paul, I agree with your interpretation. I know in the introduction to your book, you have some uh, physicists commenting, and they agree with your interpretation, and you cite many of the great founders of quantum physics to uh, support your point, but I would wager that if we were to go into the physics departments of most colleges and universities and do a survey of uh, average practicing physicists and, and professors, instructors of physics, and uh, people who work in uh, cyclotrons and other physics laboratories, only a, only a small percentage would acknowledge what you've just said. Yeah, and that's true. And that that to me is just mind blowing. And it actually but it points to something it points to e even, you know, the most um, brilliant of the academic corporate physicists, um, you know, are still uh, entrained in in the duality of subject object in the fact that this isn't a dream. And um, so it's like being under a spell. And here's the thing. So say if I'm a corporate academic physicist, right? And I'm in what, you know, I'm in this, this collective dream phenomena like we're all sharing right now. But if I'm that corporate academic physicist and if I hold a viewpoint that this is not a dream and well, guess what? The dream being a reflection of the very mind that's observing it is going to then shape shift and instantaneously in no time at all faster than we can think or blink, reflect back to us all the evidence confirming our viewpoint that this world is objective. So now we have evidence confirming the seeming rightness and objectivity of our viewpoint as that academic physicist. I'm holding the viewpoint that this is an objective world, that it's not a dream. And then I get more fixed in my viewpoint. So I see it even more as being not a dream and objective. And the more I see it that way, the more than this dreamlike universe reflects back all the evidence confirming my viewpoint. So the actual nature of the dream confirms to them that this isn't a dream. And another way of translating that is they've actually 
um, hypnotize themselves via the creative genius and the creative potency of their own mind in a way that they've become unconscious. And that's, in essence, what I'm pointing at, that quantum physics, when you actually contemplate it in the way that I'm pointing at, can help to see through that and can help to unlock that. You know, so what I'm basically saying is that for those, and you're totally right, those, you know, amazing, um, you know, people in technology and engineers and physicists who are part of corporate academic physics, you know, very many of them um, are actually um, under a trance whose origin, interestingly enough, is in their own mind. And, um, and, and then, thankfully, there are some who are on the cutting edge who are just having real integrity to follow what the universe is showing us. And they're the ones who are beginning more and more to suspect Wow, this is some sort of a dream. And thankfully, there are, there are, you know, many, many physicists, you know, who are actually getting switched on to that. I think another way of, of phrasing what you've just said is that uh, quantum physics now tells us, and many other sources tell us as, as well, you cite uh, Tibetan Buddhist teachers, for, ex for example, the universe is so very, very magical that people who don't want it to be magical can use the power of their mind to uh, banish magic from their worldview. Exactly. And that reminds me in Tibetan Buddhism, um, there's a teaching and it's actually this, this hidden treasure, which I, I want to talk about in a little bit. Um, and, um, and what this treasure says, and I've essentialized it into four words is as viewed, so appears as viewed, so appears, right? That's the actual teaching in this, um, hidden treasure in Tibetan Buddhism. And you think about that, that's like the uh, precise articulation of how we create reality and of the nature of a dream. That as you view something, being that a dream is nothing other than a reflection of your own mind. If you're holding a viewpoint, then the, the dream has no choice but to actually just reflect back the very viewpoint you're holding. And if you're not awake to that process, then you become entranced by your own mind in such a way that, like you were just saying, you know, um, our, our great power to call forth reality gets turned against us in a way that's actually killing us. And that's this process that I'm talking about in the microcosm in each of us as individuals is getting played out writ large on the world stage in such a way that we're destroying the biosphere, the life support system of the planet, which is to we're committing this this suicide, this collective suicide. The, and it's all because we're not switched on to the this genius power that we all have. And what I'm basically saying in essence is that quantum physics comes along. And if you look at it in a certain way, it's like reflecting this back and it's giving us insight into the very medicine that we need to wake up. I did find in your book, in, in a footnote, uh, only mentioned briefly, but there is an alternative, a, a, a strong alternative explanation, the many worlds interpretation of uh, Everett, uh, which, which suggests that it's really not consciousness that creates all of this. What's really going on is that uh, uh, at any given moment, the universe is splitting into zillions of parallel universes so that everything is actually happening all at once. Yeah, well, you know, that's really interesting because one way um, that I try to understand that, you know, so here quantum physics is trying to understand what is the building blocks of this universe? What is the, the microstructure? And by, so say you have a quantum entity, you know, the most elementary particle and quantum physics has discovered that that elementary particle before it's observed, it exists in a state of every and any potentiality that it ever could exist in, but in potential. And then here comes an observer, and the observer observes that quantum entity, and all of a sudden, it actualizes into particular manifestation in 3D space-time, and all the other actualities, they just disappear as if they never existed, or you could say they exist in a parallel world. 
And, and that experience, we're threading ourselves moment by moment through that universe where each moment, by the way we're observing, where the, the wave function is getting collapsed, each moment that those infinite or, or close to infinite potentialities um, actualize into whatever particular manifestation in such a way that we then entrance ourselves into thinking that the world we're experiencing is objective, separate from us, that it's continuous, where quantum physics is saying, no, each moment is, is re this universe is recreating itself anew every moment. And even though it appears to have a, con a continuity and a solidity, it's actually, you know, recreated out of the void every nanosecond. And the key factor, though, I, you know, really want to emphasize in that whole um, process is consciousness. Well, you talk about uh, the principle of complementarity in, in in physics, which suggests that on on the one hand, the universe recreates itself moment by moment, and and these are very very tiny, fast moments. Uh, Planck time, I suppose, is one way to put it. But but on the other hand, every point in the universe, every wave and particle is intimately connected with every other wave and, and particle all the time. And, and to add to the confusion, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, a photon traveling at the speed of light experiences no time at all. So one, one might well say, along with uh, Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher, that time and space are illusions too created by our nervous system. Yeah, and that's and that's one thing that I talk about that in the book that there are constructs of the mind in a certain way. And the thing which is interesting about what you were just saying is that the quantum universe is it's there's a, a seamless wholeness. It's not made of separate parts. So there is not even an example of, of the observer effect. It's not there's the observer, there's the object observed, and there's the act of observation, and there are separate you know entities interacting. No, in a quantum world, and keep in mind that quantum physics has discovered that this universe that we inhabit is quantum on all scales, that it's quantum through and through. So in a sense, we are quantum entities ourselves. And so there's this sense of interconnectedness. There's this, it's not like, you know, the idea that, oh, here's light and it, it has the speed limit of 186,000 miles per second. In the quantum world, it's like, well, um, it's this non-local world in that, the laws of three-dimensional space-time are transcended and every part of the universe is interconnected and inseparable and undivided from every other part of the universe. And so that's really, you know, one of the fundamental um, understandings um, that quantum physics is bringing in and, and the implications of that are just amazing. And if I could just say one thing about quantum physics being a spiritual path, because it's so profound. So here I was talking about that the rabbit hole is understanding that um, there's no such thing as an objective, not only world, but objective anything. And there's no such thing as things that exist intrinsically independently in and of themselves, that everything is interdependent and interconnected. And an example being, I don't exist as a intrinsically existing independent entity just from my own side, separate from anybody else. But I exist relative to you, for example, Jeffrey. And so, but you don't exist as an independent, intrinsically existing objective entity in and of yourself. You only exist in relation to other people, to the rest of the universe, who themselves don't exist independently, intrinsically. So it's like this interconnected net where we're all in, in Tibetan Buddhism, they'll call it interdependent co-origination, that every part of the universe is evoking and being evoked by simultaneously every other part. And um, so how quantum physics, you see, so that's really this other sort of fundamental, you know, kind of way of understanding what quantum physics is showing, because once you really take in that quantum physics is showing there's nothing objective, well, if this universe that we're in isn't objective, then what happened to the subject? What happened to us as a subject? I, as a subject, need an object to be in relationship to in order to be a subject. But when there's no objective anything, all of a sudden, it sheds light on and puts into question, wait a second, who am I? And, um, you know, so that's where, when I was saying before that quantum physics promotes itself to be a spiritual path, 
it's actually shedding light on the nature of ourselves. Well, you go through your day, and I imagine, like everybody else, you have breakfast in the morning, you go to bed at night, you interact with people throughout the day. Most of the time, we carry out our business without concerning ourselves with the fact that it's all an illusion. On one hand, it's an illusion, but not in the way we think it is in a certain way. Um, but, you know, you, you play your role as if it's unbelievably important. And, um, you know, so it's this weird, it's this weird paradox. And, um, you know, the idea when you hear, cause a lot of in Eastern tradition, you'll hear, oh, it's an illusion or it's just a dream and thereby it doesn't mean anything or it's like this nihilistic point of view. No, no, it's not. That's not the proper way of understanding that. Um, you know, the illusion, like, so we actually, um, you know, are projecting onto the inkblot, like think about what a dream is. It's an inkblot. It's a projection. It's a reflection. And so when we like project onto the inkblot, you know, it's not like we project onto the inkblot of the waking dream. We're just on an actual flat inkblot and we project one moment and two moments later we see the butterfly. No, the very moment we project as viewed so appears, the very moment is that butterfly, if that's what we're projecting, actually will manifest. And, um, but the point is we then react to that projection, in this case, the butterfly, as if it's actually objective. And then we become conditioned by our projection via our reaction to it. And that's the way we actually entrance ourselves, you know, as compared to if you actually see that process and, and have the recognition that it's just like a dream that you've woken up in at night and having this lucid dream that this world we're inhabiting is our own mind. That that's, you know, that's really what quantum physics is potentially showing us. It's a very deep insight. And, and I think it's difficult to grasp. You used at one point the metaphor of a magic mirror that, that the universe is like a magic mirror reflecting ourselves back to us. And that makes me think like all the wisdom traditions talk about that. I mean, interesting etymologically, um, mirror means the holder of the shadow, but also in the apocryphal text, Christ says, and of course this got written out of the Bible. Christ says, I am a, I am a mirror to those that know me. Okay. Now the thing about a mirror, which is really interesting, it itself has no form. It's invisible. You would never see it without, if there are objects, then the objects actually get reflected via the mirror and the reflection seemingly obscure the silvered surface of the mirror, but simultaneously they reveal it. You would never notice the mirror there without the reflections. It's like a psychedelic where like, you know, just like you take a psychedelic or a plant medicine and over time it just comes on more and more and more. The more I've gone down the quantum physics like that rabbit hole, the more um, it's just expanded my consciousness and, and revealed the enormity of what it's offering us. Well, if we go with the premise that every part of the universe is entangled or intimately connected with every other part of, of the universe, then we have to say to ourselves, I must be much more than just, uh, as Alan Watts famously put it, a skin encapsulated ego. That if I understand myself uh, in terms of the wholeness of who I am, I'm much, much larger, vastly larger, infinitely larger. I want to go back to that hidden treasure tradition in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, it's actually called uh, Terma, the Terma tradition. And, and it's actually, I do practice to a particular, you know, this lineage. And that's the way the Terma, the hidden treasures, that's the way the lineage in a sense, um, propagates itself over time and refreshes itself and, and keeps itself sort of vital and fresh in that these hidden treasures and the way that, that the, the tradition envisions it is that there are these hidden treasures that are hidden, encoded within the fabric of the universe. Okay. In all different dimensions in the earth, in the, in our minds, just every element all over the place. And, um, and it's very much like, 
when you have a dream, think about what a dream is. A dream is an expression of the unconscious and a dream compensates a one-sidedness. So when we get overly one-sided and out of balance, all of a sudden we'll have a dream and the dream will be a compensation. It'll through symbols, symbols are the language of dreams, and it'll actually present us with a particular symbol um, that if we actually have the recognition of the symbol and get into alignment with it, it will bring us back to ourselves. It'll help us to remember who we are and to get back in balance. Well, the thing with this, with the terma, the hidden treasure tradition, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, so Tibetan Buddhism would say, oh, yeah, whenever like the community of practitioners, when they get a little bit off balance or unconscious or just they're in need, they're in having this need of the next practice to do or, you know, or particular blessing or something like that, all of a sudden, one of these treasures will manifest in the universe at exactly the right moment in time. And the person who is destined to discover it will actually bring it forth and they'll be the one to find the treasure and to bring it forth to the community. And whether it's like a teaching or a prayer and it's very much like a symbol that's crystallizing, you know, out of the dream or into the dream. And it's offering us exactly what we need, sort of like taking this, this multi, this, this like, you know, a vitamin mineral that, you know, is exactly that the universe naturally secretes so as to, um, to bring us back to ourselves. So why I talk about the, the Terma tradition, and I just given a few months ago this, this big talk about this, um, is that now I'm, I'm certainly no enlightened person. I have no authorization. I, I'm not one of those special people who discovers Terma, the hidden treasures. Um, but I know about the tradition and I know about quantum physics and just my own personal opinion. I am absolutely 100% convinced that quantum physics is a modern day analog to a Terma that we have literally dreamed up quantum physics into the world and into our minds to to show ourselves to remind ourselves to help us remember who we are to help us remember we're not a skin encapsulated ego like to make reference to that alan watts quote but that who we are is much grander and and larger all of us and this is you know i mean christ himself was saying this in the bible when he says like ye, ye are gods and scripture cannot be broken and yeah we all kind of intellectually have a sense oh yeah we have a divine part but what I'm pointing out is that, you know, one way of really interpreting quantum physics is that it's something that we collectively have dreamed up so as to help us um, to remember who we are. One of the points you make is that since we know from quantum entanglement that the universe is an undivided whole, that if if we are to best work with the universe it's it's by getting in touch with our own undivided wholeness and and most of us are, are kind of fractured yeah and that goes back to that thing you were saying about like the typical corporate academic physicists they're not necessarily spiritual practitioners you know so they're the idea of you know spiritual practitioner or just somebody who's psychologically fluent is somebody who's really prioritizing you know the you know becoming whole and and you know the the individuation process of becoming who they are and so your typical physicist just like like the typical any person isn't necessarily you know that's not their priority and so because they themselves aren't in touch with their own wholeness in a sense, you can't really have the recognition of the wholeness of the quantum universe that is like, you know, um, being reflected back. So you make a really important point that the way for us to really say if we're a physicist for really to do the best physics is simultaneously not just to study the outside world, but to understand that the outside world being like a dream is reflecting us, the inside world. And that if we do work on on our inner process and connect with our wholeness, that actually helps to, to for us to more clearly see the wholeness that's intrinsic to a quantum universe. Yeah, I have many guests on this program and many viewers as as well who would point out, and I think correctly so, that science, for all of its wonders and and metaphysical beauty, has contributed to the pollution on the planet and to the oppression of 
of people that uh, many people are very afraid of, of the fact that science, uh, especially materialistic science, is becoming a, a dominant worldview to the detriment of life itself on the planet. That's the thing that really concerns me because that actually is seeing this universe that the primary fundamental, um, you know, sort of um, whatever, like the level of the universe is material, is physical. And, and that's, that's a wrong view. That's what quantum physics is saying by inquiring into the nature of the physical universe and trying to understand the building blocks of it. It discovered that there was nothing there, that there was nothing of there other than one's mind, other than consciousness itself. You see, that's one way in. And this really, you know, it so is in agreement with the deeper um, understandings in psychology, in like, you know, with um, depth psychology, where through this synchronistic phenomena, and think about what is synchronicity, what it is, it's like, oh, there's some sort of like seemingly external event in the world that will manifest expressing the internal, um, in you know, the, the situation inside of our psyche, that the inner and the outer are somehow expressing or reflecting each other, which is to say that they're actually not separate. And keep in mind, what did Christ say in the, in, um, the apocryphal text? I think it's um, in Tom, the Gospel of Thomas, um, you enter the kingdom when you make the inner is the outer. Well, what's a situation where the inner is the outer? It's a dream. What is a dream? It's like the inner psyche of the dreamer is getting elaborated and expressed via the medium of the outside world, the seemingly outside world of the dream. So the idea being that, you know, whether you're talking from the psychological point of view with synchronicities or from the physics point of view, the point is, is that quantum physics is actually shedding light on that mind and matter are not separate. You see, we've been entranced through the materialistic viewpoint to think, oh, there's the physical world and then there's consciousness and the two are separate. Well, if you remember, quantum physics is saying this universe is quantum through and through and there's a wholeness. There's no separate parts. It's not like physical matter and consciousness are interacting like they're two separate entities. No, they're one and the same thing, you know, and to see that all of a sudden, how can you possibly see that? By, only by having an expansion of consciousness. And, and one way of describing that expansion of consciousness is that you're beginning to see the dreamlike nature of reality. You're beginning to wake up. And when you see the dreamlike nature of reality, you, that's a, a, like this other way of saying you're beginning to tap into your agency, to your creative power that we wield every moment in actually creating our experience. Because think about it. Quantum physics discovered the way we set up our experiment, the questions we asked, how we interpreted the data determined what answers we were getting back. You know, and 100 years ago, when they first um, encountered this, it was so off their radar because they had been entranced that this world was objective and they were just trying to study it. But in, in the two slit experiment, that was the classic experiment or, you know, that was the that that was like the experiment that, you know, um, all of the revelations of quantum physics, in a sense, have been said to be enfolded within the double slit experiment, because that was the experiment that consciousness entered the physics lab, and they haven't been able to get rid of it since. It's not going away. It's the skeleton in their closet. And, you know, it's something that's demanding to be taken seriously. If everybody had this revelation uh, that you're describing, we wouldn't have uh, worker bees in, in our culture. Individuals who show up at the factory every day or the meatpacking plant or, uh, you, you know, if, pe if everybody saw themselves from this magical, mystical perspective, it's, it strikes me our economy would have to be very, very different. Our, our whole world might uh, look very, very different than it looks today. Yeah, no, totally. And, um, you know, so it makes me think Jung talks about that oftentimes the unconscious will create a, an unbelievably like fatal, potentially fatal situation. You know, we will dream ourselves into a corner right at the edge of a cliff. And um, but that's what we need to actually access, you know, the parts of us that are the best, most genius, creative parts. 
And I would say when you when you view our world as if it's a dream, you know, you actually see that that we who are the dreamers, we're dreaming ourselves into a corner or the edge of a cliff or, you know, in this incredibly like dark place where we're, you know, just just destroying ourselves and, you know, I'm invoking this catastrophe. But yet, you know, then there's quantum physics, which is offering us the medicine. And if we were to actually um, take that in, what that would look like is that each and every one of us would connect with our creative agency and our creative power. And then we would realize, particularly when you connect with other people who are also having this realization, oh my God, that we're having a collective dream and this universe is manifesting this way because we've all been conditioned and we've all been entrained and we've hypnotized ourselves to think with these limited beings and and why this universe is manifesting in such a problematic, limited, fearful way is because that's the way we've been conditioning ourselves and been conditioned to dream it. And as one person and two and 10 and 100, you know, we wake up out of that spell and connect with our creative agency, not only the economy, but the whole world, you know, we can actually recreate the world in a way that's much more in alignment with who we're discovering ourselves to be, which is that we're not separate from each other, that we're interdependent and interconnected and we depend on each other for our survival and, and well-being. And what I'm pointing out is we're actually being invited to participate in our own evolution. Okay. And, and that's, and you know, keep in mind when I say quantum physics is a terma, it's just a terma. There's many, many termas. The coronavirus pandemic is also a revelation. It's also a hidden treasure. If you view it in a certain way. Everything and anything is is a hidden treasure. This universe is a living oracle, and it's speaking symbolically. And just remember, symbols are the language of dreams. And what I'm pointing at is when you see the dreamlike nature and you stabilize yourself in that perspective, you know, as viewed so appears, the more you see the dreamlike nature, the more this universe will reveal its dreamlike nature. And the more it reveals its dreamlike nature, the more stabilized and strengthened you are in in having that realization. But particularly when you connect with other people who are having that realization, it's what I call you can dream, we can dream ourselves awake. Okay. We can co-inspire to we can conspire to co-inspire each other, which is that's a real conspiracy theory. And we can activate the um genius, the collective genius that's latent in all of us. Particularly, you know, this is the idea in Buddhism. They talk about the triple jewel, the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the teacher, the teaching, and, and the Sangha is the community of fellow practitioners. And, um, you know, and I think about in Buddhism, they talk about that who we are are these like bodhisattvas in training. And my favorite sort of like translation of bodhisattva, it's a being in the process of awakening. And that's all of us. And when you connect with other beings in the process of awakening and you put our like what we're realizing together, you know, like I'm saying, you can activate the collective genius, dream ourselves awake, conspire to co-inspire, however you want to say it. Um, as an artist, I'm actually creating an art happening called um, Global Awakening. And anybody can join free membership and we're creating it as we're. We literally, once we realize what's available to us, because if I could just say one thing about that is so inspiring about quantum physics to me, and keep in mind, some of the greatest quantum physicists are saying that when they would get depressed, they there would be two go-tos. There would be, oh, I'd listen to like Beethoven or because they were classical, you know, into, into music, that form of music or whatever your favorite form of music is, or I would contemplate quantum physics to be an antidepressant. And here's an example of how inspiring quantum physics can be. Um, that quantum entity, like I was saying before, before it's observed, it exists in every and any state that it possibly could. And then you observe it, wave function collapses, it actualizes into a particular manifestation, all the other possibilities, they vaporize, they go into a parallel world, however you want to phrase it. But the point is, 
and it's not me saying this, these are the founding fathers saying this, that even if one of those possibilities of that quantum entity is highly, ridiculously, incredibly unlikely, it could be the way the universe manifests this very moment. Okay, so if we get entranced in pessimism and thinking, oh, it's so easy to just feel like, oh, my God, I feel all this despair and depression and things seem so dark in the world. And if you get hooked by a pessimistic point of view, as viewed so appears by the power of dreaming, you're, you're going to invoke all the evidence you need to confirm the objective truth of your viewpoint, your pessimistic viewpoint. And then you're actually part of the problem. Then you're actually invoking and creating the very thing you're afraid of. But what quantum physics is saying is that even that highly ridiculously unlikely possibility, such as what if sufficient number of human beings wake up to actually catalyze a collective global awakening? Quantum physics says that is absolutely in the realm of possibility. And if you're not envisioning that, then I would ask, what are you thinking? Uh, one way to think of that is that uh, an event might be so improbable that it only occurs once in the whole history of the universe. But that's what happens every moment. Exactly. Exactly. And then once you establish yourself in that viewpoint, the realm of the possible just expands to the point where you're like holding, you know, um, the nature of your experience and the nature of this universe that we're inhabiting and the nature of ourselves and our own possibilities and potentialities in such an expanded way that can only help. Yeah. Well, it strikes me that, uh, as you said in the beginning of, of the book, you're writing the book as an act of ceremonial magic. And if the message here seems to be that we all have the potential to be magicians. It's up to us to be good magicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that was one of the things that some of the, some of the um, founding fathers were concerned. They were, they were recognizing, oh my God, we're tapping into, like tap the energy of tapping into the atom with atomic energy. They were realizing, oh my God, that's the palest reflection of the energy we're tapping into with reference to the psyche to the incredible creative energy that um, quantum physics was beginning, you know, to access. And they were concerned going, oh, my God, this energy, it could be used for good or evil, you know. And um, I mean, I hate to say it, but there was powers that be a lot of the revelations of quantum physics have been kept from the public, you know, because um, and whether this is consciously or not, that if if sufficient number of people got switched on to what quantum physics is saying, and keep in mind the the physicists who were getting turned on to this were basically they were lamenting, going, "It's a pity, it's a tragedy that not more people are switched on to the insights of quantum physics because it's basically like this magic wand that's fallen from heaven, and it's actually you know showing us." the incredible power that all of us have. And one way of understanding that, a beautiful image, this one physicist, he uses this image. He says, imagine if you've never seen an automobile and you come across an automobile and you have no idea what it's about. And you like, you know, turn on the turn signals or the windshield wiper or the lights or the radio. And it all seems kind of cool but the idea is, you know, that's not quite the central point. You don't quite know what it's really about until you actually turn it on and drive the car. And that um, physicist is saying that's our relationship to quantum physics. We've developed, you know, transistors or lasers or computers. That's like turning on the hands, the, the, the turn signal in the car. But we haven't figured out the central idea. And he is convinced that the central idea is unbelievably simple. And when we actually see it, we're going to hit ourselves on the head going, how could I be so, how could I have been so blind? And, um, for so long. And I'm presenting that the central idea very, very simply is that we're having a collective dream. Now keep in mind, I'm not talking in the metaphorical way saying this is like a dream. I remember years ago I had this very eminent Tibetan translator, this Westerner, come over. We had tea, 
And um, we got into a little debate and he was saying, no, 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 the teachings of the Dharma is saying this is like a dream. And I was going, no, 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 the teachings of Dharma are saying this is a dream. This isn't like a dream. It's not metaphorical. And, and I'm, I'm convinced I'm right. But um, I mean, it was very friendly, you know, argument. And so I'm basically um, offering the perspective. And I feel like, you know, saying to people, don't take my word for it. Do the experiment yourself. You know, just like the Buddha was saying when he examined this mind and he, he discovered who he was. He wasn't wanting people who, who just unthinkingly followed him or believed him. He was wanting people to do the experiment yourself. And the idea being to really do the experiment moment by moment of the nature of your own experience, of the nature of your mind. And you begin in Tibetan Buddhism, they'll talk about the emptiness, the Buddha nature. And, and I, in the book, I talk about that the Buddha really had discovered exactly the, what quantum physics has discovered. He discovered it, you know, 2,500 years ago. Um, but it's, I point out that they map onto each other precisely, that it's the same realization. And, um, you know, so, um, that's really the simple and central idea that I'm pointing at that any of us can discover if you just inquire into quantum physics, into the nature of your experience, that is that we're having a collective dream. And when you actually stabilize that realization and connect with other people who are also realizing that we can change the dream we're having. And that's not new age, woo woo, flaky, fluffy stuff. That's the hardest core of hardcore science. Well, Paul Levy, once again, this has been a very inspirational conversation. Uh, it's a deep, profound message. It's taken our culture a century to, to begin to digest uh, these findings from quantum physics. And I think you've done an excellent job of making it very clear. I uh, encourage our viewers to take a look at your book, The Quantum Revelation. Thank you so much, Paul, for being with me. Jeffrey, it is totally my pleasure. Thank you so much. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us.